Well, today we're going to delve a little bit into volts and amps and stuff and a little bit of a, uh, basic electrical and some, uh, some other stuff that you might be surprised by. And uh, so I'm going to jump into this thing and we're going to start. Now imagine yourself being given a test like this in a class and having to complete it with 100% accuracy within 90 seconds. Uh, when I went to Craig Van Vattenberg's hybrid uh, training school back in 2010, uh, he did something similar to this. Now I created this one for my students at the college and they, in order to solve this you have to understand this uh, Ohm's law situation where you know you multiply uh, amps times ohms to get volts and you divide either one of those to get the other one. So if you know your ohms but you don't know your amps you can divide volts by ohms and get amps. All right. And so let's see how this plays out. Now this is a parallel circuit where each load is grounded. Now parallel circuit in regard to the loads. Uh, each two ohm bulb would pull six amps. All right. So now you got to realize that whenever you turn on a light, uh, the resistance increases uh, whenever you turn on the light so that it actually is going to have a lot more resistance than two ohms or a good bit more. Okay, so the total current draw of this circuit, if all of these bulbs remained at 2 ohms, or if each, each load, regardless of what those loads were, remained at 2 ohms, you would have 6 amps per load. See, and so you'd have 24 amps being drawn by this. Now that little bit of uh, 70 ohm coil in the relay is actually going to pull a little current too, but it's only like 0.1, you know, 0.171 amps. It's a little tiny amount, 171 milliamps, that's what that would be. All right. So, however, you got to recognize that with the bulbs illuminated, the values will change, and so uh, you're going to wind up with about five ohms per bulb, and that's going to give you about 2.4 amps uh, with a total of 9.6. So basically, uh, uh, let's talk about that for a minute. Let's say you're building a circuit, uh, like you're wiring up your, you know, some buggy you're building or something like that, and you you got You need to know how many bulbs you've got, how much each bulb pulls. Now this is a little bit of a misnomer because typically the little side marker lamps like what we over here will actually have more resistance than these bulbs. The brighter a bulb burns the less resistance it'll have to start going in. You know like a stop lamp filament will typically have less resistance than a tail lamp filament because it burns brighter and all that. Uh, so, But it's go these are going to increase so you got to be able to factor in that initial surge of current when you turn on the light when you choose what size fuse you're going to use. Because whenever you switch this thing on, I created this graph, but I've seen this played out. You switch the lights on here, you notice that they start to illuminate and there's a surge coming up here. There's a, there's a surge and then it drops off. Actually, it probably wouldn't be as pointy as that, but it, it drops off to about what they're going to use. Now on the, uh, the uh, power stroke diesels, uh, we used to be told that they've got eight glow plugs. If you put an amp clamp and you measured the current on all eight glow plugs as soon as the relay snapped closed, uh, you, you ought to see 25 amps per glow plug. Or I'd say that would uh, run out to uh, 200 amps, right? And so as they warmed up, the resistance would increase so that the current would drop to like 15 amps per glow plug. But the reason we did that on the power stroke diesels was to see if we had one burned out glow plug. See, because not all of those things had a system set up like the California truck so that the glow plugs were measured and all that kind of thing. One way or another though, the amperage surges initially, uh, you know, if it goes up to 2.4 and then it drops down to 9.6, you got to have a fuse that will handle that initial surge or you're going to wind up replacing fuses all the time. You put a 15 amp fuse in here, it's going to pop that fuse when you turn on the light. It may not pop it the first time, but it's going to weaken that filament a little bit every time until it finally you know, lights off. And, you know, you might say, well, they're only pulling 9.6 amps, so I'll use a 10 amp fuse. Well, that would be a no, non-starter right to begin with. Now in Texas, we had a couple of pipe loaders like this. This is a, the, like the pipe loader that we had. You know, the, these, this kind of attachment here is good for logs or pipe. Uh, typically for a pipe it'll be made a little more robust and a little stronger you run up under the pipe and these uh, these these things here clamp it down you know basically what happened you know the uh, this thing right here clamps down on the 
pipe or whatever. And, and with this picked up, it can actually go far, farther. It can stop at the ground there. Anyway, um, it's kind of funny. They we had a four, uh, 17 forklifts, and none of them had lights on them. None of that. None of these pipe loaders had lights on them. And the company ran 24 hours a day. Uh, you know, they were always moving pallets around out there. And I was working in the maintenance department, keeping the forklifts and the cars and the trucks and the pipe loaders. I mean, I did a little bit of work on the cranes, but I absolutely hated cranes. I didn't like working on cranes. Uh, but uh, anyway, I said I had to wire up uh, lights on all these. Uh, what had happened was this one guy decided that he was going to drive from one dock down to another, which is connected by the county road. And so he got on one of those old Y60D uh, Clark uh, fork, I mean, uh, CY60, I'm sorry, Clark forklifts, and he headed down there. And whenever he was about halfway down there, there was a Torino that come buzzing through there, couldn't see him until it ran into him. It, it totaled out that Torino and broke the guy's leg that was driving a Torino, busted the transmission housing on the forklift, and but the guy that was on the forklift, he was using it for a vehicle to go from one dock to another to get his coat. And so I had to take that uh, transmission out of that forklift and tear it down and we ordered another transmission housing and I had to rebuild the, you know, put all of the components from the original transmission in there. It was a job. It, had, it took some special tools to do it, but anyway, it was quite a uh, operation there. Anyway. So I said, how am I going to put uh, lights on here that are 24 volt? Couldn't find 24 volt bulbs. Might be available now, but I couldn't find them then. This 24 volt system. And so I wired them up in series so that while you got two batteries here wired up in series, giving you 24 volts, I went back the other way and wired the headlights in series and so that each one of them was running on 12 volts and it worked really well. The only problem is if you blow one light you lose both lights and you got to figure out which light's blown. You know if you break a series circuit you're going to lose the whole series circuit. Not so with a parallel circuit. But I couldn't put a parallel circuit on here because I couldn't find the right you know 24 volt bulbs for that. Um, now this is a parallel versus a series circuit. Each bulb has the same voltage and each bulb has its own dedicated ground so if you lose any of these uh, you're going to wind up with uh, other ones still working on a series voltage. Now this is like your dash lights, uh, and, and wired in series with your dash lights, you would have a uh, a little uh, potentiometer thing. Well, it's actually more like a a rheostat because a potentiometer doesn't carry a load. A rheostat does. So series voltage is divided three ways. You might notice that this has to go through every bulb before it finds its way to ground. Okay, so if you lose that, you're going to wind up uh, with all of the lights going down. Uh, or if there's any break in the circuit anywhere. Now this is a mind-boggling thing to me. I had this little exercise that I created for a Skills USA composition, and I was sitting there, and there was like 40 or 50 students that was going through that one little station that I was manning, and I had a power supply, and I had these uh, this a resistor, a lamp, and a switch, and they had to actually wire this circuit up. So they had to connect power. Then they were supposed to connect power from the switch through the resistor and then uh, using jumper wires and they were making a connection between the resistor and the bulb and then this side would be ground so the power was on the other side grounds over here when I would when they get to the part of the little worksheet and they had only 10 minutes to do it I said uh, what your net what you need to do is go ahead and uh, you know follow the sheet when I got to the place that wire it up some of those guys would take jumper wires hooked to both sides of my power supply, which was an electric power supply plugged into the wall, but it had a little 12 volts. And they would try to connect the power to each side of the switch, power to one side of the switch and, power, and ground to the other side. And see, at that point, I was a judge and not a teacher. And so I had to say, stop what you're doing. And they put, I said, put your jumper wires down. And I'd have them lean back and I'd say, you're done. We're not, we're not, we're not going to do anything else today. <laughs> and they'd get, they'd get mad. But if they don't know any better than to hook power to one side of a switch and ground to the other side of the switch. They don't have any reason to even be sitting at that table. Um, and so they would, you know, they would flunk my part of the exercise. The switch should always be wired in series with the load. If you're, you're, you're just going to break one leg of this, you know, now, like when your airbags, you're going, you're, you break both sides of it so that both switches have to close, you know, for obvious reasons. So you want both airbag crash sensors to close before it'll light off the airbag. You don't want just one of them lighting it off, you know. Now this is a parallel voltage measurement. You'll notice your voltage over here. Uh, if you're just hooked all four, all of this, this voltage is the same all the way along each rail there. And so every time you turn that switch on, 
you're going to see that uh, the same voltage that you're getting out of your battery. I think I got that backwards. I think the parallel is the one that's harder to <laughs> Never mind that. Just move on. I don't want to confuse anybody. Uh, just enjoy the video part of it. And uh, um, it's, it's early in the morning and I just had my coffee, but it hadn't totally kicked in yet. So excuse me for that. This right here is how a TP sensor works, basically. Um, and it's a pretty cool little deal. Now what you got is you got a voltage regulator here. Uh, that is like 5 volts and it's, I got the, I'm measuring the voltage regulator voltage and as that TP sensor goes up and down you're going to see this uh, this voltage change along with that. Uh, you can see that slide again when I'm recording this thing I can't go back and replay the video but you can see what I'm talking about here but if you lose your signal return you got issues there. See what I'm saying? All right, and so that's going to be that you're going to always have the same voltage here regardless of what you do with the TP sensor if that ground is broken. And you can have terminal resistance and that kind of stuff too. So anyway, terminal resistance will cause voltages to be deflected and, and that kind of thing or fa failures within the sensor can do that. Now a relay provides a way for a weak signal to control a heavy load like on this cooling fan circuit. Okay, and so you basically want a low current signal to click this relay shut, which is like 70, 60, 60 to 70 ohms, usually what that coil is. That resistor is there to keep, a, uh, keep it from sending out a spike whenever you release the relay and you don't want that collapsing field to create a spike. It's going to go back and damage this solid state, which it will do that if it doesn't have a, you know, a clamping resistor or a clamping diode. And you got a high current load being carried here. This is the muscle. This is the secondary part of the relay. This is the primary part of the relay. It's kind of like on ignition coils. What triggers it's the primary and where the work's done is the secondary. Not that complicated. Standalone relays are still around, but a lot of relays are built into the fuse panel or junction box. Uh, but these are potted relays. These little potted relays here are kind of interesting, and they fail in ways that these other relays don't usually. They'll do crazy things. I saw uh, the, this Nissan solid-state relay like this one time that Whenever you turned on the blower, it wouldn't work for about five minutes, and then it would kick in and start working. And we swapped out the you know, relay with the rear window defrost relay, and it was perfect. So that relay was, you know, had a delayed come on. I don't know what the deal was on that inside. These other relays have got a pin out like this one, or this one does, uh, but it's basically just a mechanical relay in there with a, a coil and that kind of stuff. These are your older Toyota relays. They had various different configurations. This had more pins than this. The older Ford relays look like this. The GM 4 pin and the GM 4 pin. These right here were both configured the same. It's pretty cool how they set these up uh, because you could, because of the way they set these up, the call was, you know, across, I mean, catty cornered across from uh, the other side of the call, and the uh, load carrying terminals were catty cornered across too. Some of them would be a 5 pin. They have another pin here that would be a normally closed thing. But the simple fact is, you could turn, you could flip that relay around and plug it in backwards, and it would still work the same way. Uh, and then you got a, a, G, a Ford ISO five pin, and then you, of course, as your other GM. This one here, this one here, if you look, works just like that one there does. You know, it's the same deal. Uh, this motorhome, the shop foreman came and uh, talked to, had his customer come talk to me. He parked his motorhome three weeks ago, running this fine, and his spins won't restart. He's standing right there in the, in front of the guy, I said, "You got ants in the relay." And we went out there, and I, uh, we turned. He turned on the key, and uh, you know the fuel pump relay clicked, but it didn't deliver any power to the fuel pump because the pump wasn't running. 
you know, you could hear the pump running. It, and I got a report that, well, the pump's not running, but I heard a relay click. And uh, ants really like this electrical stuff. They will, if they can, this particular type of relay here's got a little square hole in the bottom of it. I don't know why that hole is there. Not all relays have a hole like that. But these Ford relays in this vintage had that. And there was, this is one that I found that was really loaded with ants. You can see all the ants right here, you know. But that particular one had one ant that climbed up in there and got between the points. And when that guy switched on the key, that one ant got crushed by those points. But that ant's body had enough resistance so that it couldn't deliver power to the fuel pump. That's just the way that worked out. And so that was a cool little thing where I basically told that guy what was wrong before we ever went out there and he thought I was Superman. The thing about it is during that time of year you found a lot of vehicles that had ants in the relays. I saw ants one time pile up across the top of a battery a quarter of an inch thick so that they were bridging one terminal to another on the top of the battery and it killed the battery. And like you came in with a dead battery, I opened the hood, saw them ants there. I ain't kidding you, it was, a, it was a layer of ants a quarter of an inch thick. They just kept on coming. I guess it shorts out their little communication antenna or something. I don't know what the deal is. But they really like that electrical stuff. They used to get in the uh, the points on my dad's pump that he used for his water. That is, uh, you know, out there. He had a sawmill house where he, during the week where he stayed out there. And uh, that pump, he could get no water pressure that morning. Take the little cover off the regulator out there at the deep well pump and it has all loaded up with ants and so what my dad says well I'll just get all that mess off of there and so he didn't even turn the power off he just got some bleach and he splashed it on there to wash them ants off of there and that bleach caught fire and burned up that regulator <laughs> he said I had no idea bleach would catch fire until I did that now Ford started putting these relays in a module back in the late 1980s they would put a cluster of relays in one module and you know you have your see there's Low fan, high fan, fuel, wide open air shooter cut out, and PCM. Now this right here from was an 05 Chrysler Crossfire. This this one right this one right here was. This is the one for that old Ford. If you look at a schematic on a GM or a Toyota schematic, and you see a symbol for a relay, but there's not any numbers telling you about the pins, 86, 87, 30, whatever. Uh, if you don't have any, uh, I think 85 and 86 are the call and. 87 and 87A would be your other terminals, and, and then 30 is your common terminal. But if you see a junction box and it's got a relay that has no numbers, you're basically going to say, well, that's built into the box, and I've got to replace the box to replace that relay. Uh, and this right here, however, on some platforms, like on this 2006 Sonata, I know for an absolute fact, if we had a trainer car like this, the door locks quit working, and we found out that the door lock relays were in, built into the inside fuse panel. You couldn't even get to them. They were just little small micro relays that were in there. And because we didn't use the door locks on that trainer car all that much, and it was nearly a new car when we got it, it was given to us by the factory, um, the door locks just were, you know, got to where they were, just wouldn't work most of the time. And so uh, this one here, you might notice it's got a lock and an unlock relay. But the problem is these are marked. Now, why they mark those if you can't get to those relays is beyond me. Because you, we actually had to go in through the connectors on the end of that little panel, I mean that uh, junction box, to test those relays. And we had to know which pin was which and all that. I actually wrote a Motor Age article about that. So, just because you see numbers on whatever schematic you're looking at, doesn't mean you can replace that relay. Now, here's where it gets really weird. Nissan Intelligent Power Distribution Module, there's a TSB on this, and that's where I got these uh, illustrations and that picture of that tool. Uh, that they'll tell you that the only serviceable parts of this Intelligent Power Distribution Unit, IDPM, is the ECM relay and the fuses. And the ECM relay can only be replaced using a special tool. If any of these other relays fail, supposedly, you're supposed to replace that whole panel. Now, it looks to me like just looking at these is you'd be able to just yank them relays right on out of there and pop another relay in there. Why they don't want you messing with them relays is beyond me unless they're afraid that when you're unplugging and plugging them back in, you'll plug them in crooked and damage the inside of the uh, IDPM. Uh, but this phantom tool here uh, that was featured in that one TSB I found from Nissan is a cool looking little tool and it showed right here how you use that guide plate to put it on there and you basically use it to pull that relay out so you were pulling it out perfectly straight and then putting it back in the same way. That guide plate kept you from going there crooked with it. 
Uh, but I looked and looked and looked using this part number. I looked it up at Kentmore. I looked it up at Nissan. You look anywhere you want to go. Some of you guys might be better at finding it than me. I absolutely could not find this tool anywhere uh, when I went looking for one. And we had to work on these. This is a photo I took of one that we worked on over there at the, uh, uh, at the college. And, and that's another view of it that I found online. But that's a picture I took under the hood of a vehicle right there. Uh, but that was just interesting to me that uh, just looking at these, you wouldn't know. Now, Toyota, some of the uh, Toyotas have got relays that are sort of all made together. You can get to them. You can actually see them working all. Uh, they don't have covers on them. they got a big cover over the whole thing. Uh, but Ford actually did that too, beginning back in the mid-80s. There was this cooling fan controller module. It was hooked into the AC. I wouldn't really call it an amplifier, but basically when you turn on the AC, it knew to run the cooling fan. And it had a relay built onto this circuit board in there. And that relay tended to fail and burn out because that cooling fan uh, carries a lot of juice. Now this, uh, this is a black tempo like the one that I bought back in... 1987, I was working at the Ford place and I saw this Tempo sitting out there. It was only a couple of years old. It was in pretty good shape, only it had a you know, ragged piece hanging off a steel belted tire. And um, I went out there. Uh, I had managed somehow when I was replacing the stator in a distributor on another Tempo, I managed to break the distributor gear. And I said, doggone it, I broke this gear. And the service manager says, well, that car sitting out there is a repo. Just go ahead and take the, and the engine's locked up because somebody had bought it and drove it 36,000 miles without changing the oil, the engine locked up. Um, and I said, uh, he said, just take the distributor out of that and pull the gear off that one and use that. So that's what I did. And I said, who owns that car? And he said, the bank does. And I, so I called the bank and I made him a bid of $800. And so uh, they took, they accepted the bid. 1200 was owed on the car. They accepted the bid. I bought a $600 engine and transmission. you got to remember this is in 1987. I bought an engine and a transmission as a unit for 600 bucks from the salvage yard out of a car that was hitting the rear or whatever. And I put that motor and that transmission in there. Now, I had to take this uh, relay, this little relay that was on his circuit board in here. I took it off. I drilled a little bit of a hole uh, in the other side of this box right here. Uh, and I took these wires right here and I soldered them. This right here, these two wires here are the ones that go to the coil. This is actually supposed to be a fuel pump relay, but it works really good for pulling a load. But this wire and this wire here, these two wires right here, were the ones that go to the coil, to the relay coil. And I could tell by looking at that board in there which wires went where. And so I soldered, I desoldered that relay from the board, and I soldered these pins in there going through a hole I drilled in this plastic box. And then I mounted this relay on the side of this plastic box with this, these wires coming out through a hole in that box, plugged into here, and so that relay was on, was changeable externally to this box now, and it would turn that fan on, and it never gave any trouble. Um, I bought a set of tires to put on the car. I had like $1,900 in it when I got through with it, and I sold it to my aunt for $3,500, and it was worth about $4,300 at the time. And my uncle drove that car for years and years and years. It only had 38,000 miles on it whenever I bought it. When I put that motor and transmission in it. And um, that car was a really good car. The air conditioner worked on it and everything. And uh, that was a little deal that I, you know, fixed up. All right, this is going to be about a 25 minute video, time everything's done. And I'll talk to you guys next time. I really appreciate you coming by. And hey, let's be careful out there. We'll see you later.